Well, Memphis, Tennessee, what a wonderful town it is. It's uh, culturally, it's given so much to our culture, uh, especially the musical side of it, but, but, but all parts of it, you know, the art, food, lifestyle, everything. It's a cool part of the world. The music, of course, is killer, but as you know firsthand, their recording studios still in action in Memphis that were there back in the day. And they still got the same people, the same families, Willie Mitchell's family, folks like that, still doing the same things. And they really haven't changed that much. Yeah, they got Pro Tools and that stuff. They may have you know, digital keyboards and things, but there's still two inch tape up there. There's still a B3 over in the corner. And they're still hanging wet towels from the bathroom and the overhead just to get the sound right, you know. So much of that music was played on Gibson 335s, 175s, ES 350s, um, 295s, obviously. Um, so it's the right place to be. Building guitars in a place that holds Sun Studios and Graceland and was home to Stax Records. B.B. King of all people and all these great musicians that came out of the Delta, and either came out of Memphis or through Memphis, um, is pretty cool. Um, ultimately, the demand for ES production, which for all the years was built in the same place that our solid body electrics were built, um, exceeded our ability to build them alongside of Les Pauls and SGs and Flying Vs, and at the time, acoustic guitars, banjos, and everything else. Um, so the decision was made uh, 10 or 12 years ago to put ES in a facility all by itself. It's at the end of Beale Street. You should go. It's a cool place. You can take a tour. And uh, uh, Beale Street is pretty neat. Each place is going to be a different dynamic in the work environment, uh, just in your mindset and, and what you do. And all of that goes into building a guitar. We've got just great people working there. Um, you'll see how, how into it everybody is. It's not just a factory with factory workers sloughing away. You know, These cats are pretty into what they're doing, and it should be reflected in the product. Um, our production techniques in Memphis, we still use a lot of old tooling, as you've seen. Um, it's not wires in a box. It really is kind of a throwback. We've got machines that we used that have been in continuous use at Gibson since 1928. Today they're building guitars better than we've ever built them. And it's not just the guitar, it's the electronics. It's all of that minutia that in years past, I have my old friends that, uh, that I've worked with for a long time that maybe worked at Gibson in the 50s and the 60s, you know, they've told me a lot about um, how they used to do things and what they used to use, parts, pieces, raw materials, and all that stuff. And I'll tell you, nobody in the history of Gibson guitars ever sat down and matched up the potentiometers that go into the guitars. Even the curving, special attention these days. It, back in the day, I promise you this is a fact, like my old friend Jim Hutchins told me, he said, I don't know what they're talking about. We used whatever wood we had. Um, and they did. The art of building that style guitar has elevated far beyond where it ever was at Gibson. Um, because now these people, that's what they do. ES style Gibson guitars uh, grew out of the, in the 30s. Um, they're all laminated construction, typically maple, poplar, maple. People say, oh yeah, they did that because carving guitars is expensive, so you could build a guitar cheaper. And certainly there were press guitars back in the day that were less expensive, but that wasn't the reason. Uh, people started trying to amplify their arch top guitars in jazz bands and making crude pickups and things and putting them on them. And the daggum things are acoustic instruments, so they're so resonant, they'd feedback like crazy. So the ES construction reduced the, uh, uh, the 
immediate resonance of the instrument, cut back on feedback. Well, when you've got a, an arched guitar that's made from thin sheets of, of wood, and it's carved off of a log on a giant lathe, as opposed to our solid body guitar materials and uh, acoustic guitar materials and things like that, where you know the, the log is sawn in long pieces. Um, and so the log's on a lathe, and it's a big knife, and that log turns, and you're peeling the wood off the log. <sighs> Very difficult thing to do. Uh, the poplar's a little easier because it's a little softer wood, uh, and the grain direction's running at different at a right angle to the maple, uh, and that is a little thicker. And then the mahogany necks, you know, we're all having trouble finding certifiable mahogany these days. Some years ago, we started paying particular attention to the kind of maple we were using for the center box. Heavy, light, dense, etc. Same thing with the kerfing. And the kerfing is that flexible piece of wood that goes around the rims that the top glues to. If we had built the 335 in 1958 that we're building today, it would have probably been almost impossible to do. A thermally curing center blocks, Adirondack spruce bracing, things like that. So things that you'll never see in a guitar. It looks the same, smells the same, feels the same, but it ain't the same guitar. It's, it's vastly improved. The glue that, that holds a guitar together has, um, has some bearing on how it sounds. And uh, if you know about uh, violin construction, to this day, they're put together using hide glue. Hide glue is a material that it's, it's uh, ultimately it's very thin. And when you join two pieces of wood with it, 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 it kind of soaks into both pieces of wood. So it's almost an invisible joint between the two pieces of wood, where, whereas when you use the yellow resorcinol glue, which you know most guitars are made from these days, and we still use an awful lot of it, um, that creates a film. So the advantage to high glue is that it's invisible. You know, those two pieces of wood are closer to being one piece of wood. I mean, you're talking about resonance and uh, tonal reproduction and attack, decay, sustain, release, all that good stuff. Um, it's important. The problem with high glue is it's a pain in the neck in manufacturing because you heat it up in glue pots and it really slows things down. You can't keep it in a bottle roll it out and all that kind of stuff. So it slows you up a little bit, which means it's more expensive. Nitrocellulose lacquer, which for decades people have said to Gibson, you knuckleheads, you know, why don't you use some more modern finishes instead of this old stuff that you've been using forever. Lacquer, even though it's way more labor intensive, you have a lot more chances to screw it up. You have to strip it down and start over. You have to wet sand, you have to buff, you have to wet sand, you have to buff. Um, ultimately, that's kind of like the high glue. It's an ultra thin finish that's more flexible than anything else that we can think of to use. More flex means less of a damping effect. All finish has a damping effect to resonance, to, to wood resonance. Uh, play a note on an acoustic guitar and just lightly lay your hand on the top and you'll, you'll hear what I'm talking about. So the best finish is no finish, but that doesn't work. You'll end up with toothpicks. So the lacquer is, is, is it's flexible. It continues to flex uh, with the wood. It continues to thin out over the years because it's uh, thinning, the lacquer thinner, the, the thinning agent in it continues to evaporate. And so the finish gets thinner and thinner. Ultimately, it starts to crack up. On a car finish, maybe that's not so good. On a guitar finish, that's cool. 
You know, if it's an old guitar, if the finish isn't cracked up, you scratch your head, what's wrong with this thing? But, um, so the finish should help the guitar improve with age because it gets lighter and it becomes less restrictive. And then taking, say, uh, Sitka spruce bracing and changing that to Adirondack spruce bracing, it's a couple ounces of wood. But again, Adirondack spruce is, uh, that's the holy grail for spruce tone woods, absolutely. The guitar is the sum of all of its parts. So just these, even these small minor improvements and changes. Okay, you can't hear it, but when you add it all up, you add all 10 of those changes up, that you can hear. So that's my story and I'm sticking with it. <laughs>